Hi there, I'm Mike Chappell, and in this Cert Mike Explains video, we're going to talk about cybersecurity incident response. As cybersecurity professionals, we spend a lot of our time building security controls that we hope will prevent an incident from happening in the first place. But the sad reality is that incidents can and will happen to even the most well-defended organizations. Because of this, today's cybersecurity professional must have a strong understanding of what to do when things go wrong. That's where incident response comes into play. Now, as we dive into how to respond to a cybersecurity incident, we'll focus on the process described by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, in Special Publication 800-61, the NIST Computer Security Incident Handling Guide. But before we get into that process, we need to have a common understanding of what it means to experience a cybersecurity incident. Here's how NIST defines it. A computer security incident is a violation or imminent threat of violation of computer security policies, acceptable use policies, or standard security practices. Now, of course, that's a pretty formal definition. If we simplify things a little bit, we're basically saying here that a security incident occurs when something goes wrong from a security perspective. Now, the best way to get ready for your organization's next cybersecurity incident is to develop a cybersecurity incident response plan. A well-developed plan describes the policies, procedures, and guidelines that will follow in the event of an actual incident. The point of the plan is to make decisions now, while we're not in the heat of a crisis, that will serve us well when it comes time for the rapid-fire decision-making of an incident. Your incident response plan should lay out the response team roles and responsibilities and the communication and coordination procedures within and outside your organization. You'll want to build a team that represents every group in your organization that has a stake in incident response. In addition to technical folks, you'll want team members from management, legal, information assurance, technical support, developers, facilities, public relations, and human resources. Now, everyone might not be involved in every incident, but you can swap team members in and out based on the circumstances of each incident. Developing this plan is part of the first phase of the incident response process, preparation. As you can see here, that's the first of four stages in the incident response process. The preparation phase helps us get ready in advance so we're prepared when an incident occurs. Next, we move on to the detection and analysis phase. That's where we actually identify that an incident is occurring and kick our plan into action. There are all sorts of things that can go wrong and cause a security incident. A hacker might try to break into one of your systems or a disgruntled employee might try to disrupt your organization's business. And not every security threat comes from a person. Natural disasters can also threaten the availability of your information and systems. The incident response program should include comprehensive monitoring that identifies all sorts of potential incidents as early as possible. All of that monitoring normally comes together at the Security Operations Center, the SOC. The team there in the SOC is responsible for identifying and triaging security incidents and then coordinating the response efforts when incidents occur. They have all sorts of information at their disposal to help them identify an incident. They see the output of intrusion detection and protection systems, security information and event management technology, network flow data, and other security tools that might identify unusual activity. They also might receive reports from outsourced monitoring services, law enforcement, or others who might detect an incident involving your organization. They then follow up on any significant alerts by analyzing operating systems, applications, and device logs. Now, at this point, you've detected a security incident, and you now need to respond to it. Before I explain the containment, eradication, and recovery phases, I just want to take a moment to invite you to visit my website at certmike.com. On that site, I have free study plans put together to help you earn your next cybersecurity certification. The plans tie together the content that you'll find in study guides, video courses, and practice tests to help you prepare for your next certification exam and pass that test on the first try. Also, if you're enjoying this Cert Mike Explains video, please take a moment to click the like button below to help other people discover it. 
If you subscribe to my channel, you'll be among the first to see my new cybersecurity videos as they come out. During the containment, eradication, and recovery phases of incident response, you have three goals. Contain the damage, remove any effects of the incident from your systems and networks, and get things back to normal as quickly as possible. If you've done your work well in the preparation phase, this is where it all pays off. The biggest difference between the earlier phases and this phase is that you've shifted from the passive activities of detection and analysis into an active phase where you are taking actions in response to the incident. Your first priority should be containing the damage caused by the incident. You want to limit the future activity of the attacker so that they can't do further damage to the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of your systems or networks. There are three primary activities that you can perform to contain the damage of a security incident. Segmentation, isolation, and removal. Segmentation is a crucial network security technique. Network administrators often use segmentation to divide networks into logical segments grouped by types of user or system. This is a staple of network security designs and it's found on almost every network. Segmentation is also useful in incident response. Once you realize that one or more systems are compromised, you may wish to contain the spread of an attack from those systems without alerting the attacker to the fact that you've detected their activity. To perform this containment, you can create a new virtual LAN called a quarantine VLAN and move those systems to the quarantine VLAN. From there, you can set up access controls that prevent the compromised systems from communicating with other systems on your network. Isolation takes segmentation to the next level. Instead of simply moving the compromised systems to a different VLAN attached to the corporate network, they're moved to a network that is completely disconnected from the rest of the network. And depending upon the isolation strategy that you use, the systems may still be able to communicate with each other, and they're still connected to the internet so that they can communicate with the attacker. Finally, removal completely disconnects impacted systems from any network. They're completely unable to communicate with other systems or the internet, and the attacker is cut off from access to the systems. Now, this approach will certainly alert the attacker to the fact that the attack was detected, but it does prevent the compromised systems from continuing to cause damage on the network. When you're responding to a security incident, you'll need to use professional judgment to decide which containment strategy is appropriate for the situation that you face. You'll need to make a trade-off decision that balances the need to continue the investigation, the desire to prevent further damage to systems, and the potential disruption to business activity. Once you've successfully contained a security incident, you can take a moment to breathe a sigh of relief, but the work of incident response has only just begun. You've managed to contain the damage caused by the incident, but now you need to move on to the eradication and recovery stages of the process. Your goal during eradication is to remove any traces of the incident from your systems and networks. If attackers compromised user accounts, you'll need to secure those accounts. If they compromise systems or network devices, you'll need to secure those configurations as well. Basically, you need to go through your network and remove any traces of the security incident so that you can be certain that you've effectively secured your organization. The second goal you have during this stage of the process is recovery. That means that you need to restore normal business operations. While the process describes eradication and recovery as two separate activities, they're very closely linked. And the reality is that eradication and recovery activities often take place side by side. It's sometimes difficult to say whether an activity you're undertaking should be classified as eradication or recovery, and frankly, it doesn't really matter. Once the incident response team returns the organization to a normal operating state, all too often the response effort ends without completing an important final step, the post-incident activities. There's a lot to do in the wake of a security incident. Let's focus on two of those activities, conducting a lessons learned session and creating an incident report. The lessons learned process is designed to provide everyone involved in the incident response effort an opportunity to reflect on their individual role in the incident and the team's overall response. It's an opportunity to improve the processes and technologies used in incident response to better respond to future security incidents. The most common way to conduct a lessons learned session is to gather everyone in the same room or connect them by video conference or telephone, and then ask a trained facilitator to lead a lessons learned session. Ideally, this facilitator will have played no role in the incident response, 
leaving them with no preconceived notions about the response effort. The facilitator should be a neutral party who simply helps to guide the conversation. As you make the improvements identified during your lessons learned process, remember to follow your organization's change management process and update your incident response plan as needed. You'll want to make sure that all of your changes are appropriately tested, approved, and documented. In addition to your lessons learned report, you should also prepare an incident summary report. This is a more technical document that details the circumstances surrounding the breach and all of the steps taken by responders during the incident response process. This summary report creates valuable institutional knowledge that may be used during future incidents and for training purposes. If you collected digital evidence during the incident, you should make a decision about evidence retention. Consult your organization's data retention policy and also determine whether there's any legal action pending before you decide to discard evidence. If you're going to retain evidence after the incident, be sure to do so in a secure manner with a well-documented chain of custody. Finally, look back at the technical details of the incident and try to identify any new indicators of compromise that might have helped you detect the incident more quickly. If you do find new indicators, be sure to add them to your organization's security monitoring program to better detect future incidents. Well, that's our journey through the world of cybersecurity incident response. We've covered a lot of ground from the early stages of preparation through detecting and analyzing incidents, containing the damage, recovering normal operations, and then wrapping things up. I hope this video helped you better understand the cybersecurity incident response process. If it did, please click the like button below and subscribe to my channel for more cybersecurity content. Thank you.